you say, I say. What you pray, I pray. What you pray, I pray. Where you go, I go. What you say, I say. What you pray, I pray. What you pray, I pray. God bless you guys. This is Pastor Julio from the Church of Fire in Christ. We're here at Mission Frame Radio, and we're doing the pulpit series. We're bringing, like I said, we're bringing in pastors from all over the uh, the place, cities, and uh, it's my turn. And uh, today, I want to talk about a subject that a lot of people don't like to talk about, and uh, money. I'm not going to ask for money. I'm not going to ask for donations. What I want to do is I want to instruct you on how to be faithful with money and what money could do for you and how money could hurt you also. But uh, if you got ears to hear, I want you to hear what the Holy Spirit wants to teach you about how money can hurt you. Amen? And how money can be a blessing. So I want you to open up your Bibles to the book of Malachi chapter 3, verse 6. The Bible says, For I, the Lord, do not change. I'm just going to go to that part of Scripture, and I'm going to pray. Father God, in the name of Jesus, I give you all the glory, all the praise. I exalt you, my Lord. I thank you for all those that are listening in on this day, Father God. You're the king of glory and the owner of all the silver and gold, Father God, the owner of the cattle on a thousand hills. And we're here, Father God, to be instructed. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if it says that God doesn't change, that means that what he spoke to Abraham, he's speaking to me today, and he's going to be giving it something to my son Christian or Samantha or their descendants. So if God doesn't change, why is it that people, hallelujah, struggle with receiving the promise of God? Why do why do people have a hard time giving at church? Or they don't want to give their tithe because they say, I don't live under the law or their offering. Or they, and they get the scraps. They get, they get the dollar that's bent and twisted and all messed up in their pocket. And that's what they want to give to God. And God saved them and set them free and put their name in the Lamb's book of life. And it's just, it's, it's crazy. But if you, got, if you want to take some notes down, I'm going to go to Numbers chapter 23. And I want to, I want to share this with you. Numbers chapter 23 for the glory of God. Remember. Money could be a weapon or it could be a necessity to hurt you. Numbers chapter 23. The Bible says in verse 19, it says, God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. Has he said, and he will not do it? Or has he spoken, and he will not make it good? Behold, I have received a command to bless. When he has blessed, then I cannot revoke it. God cannot revoke it. And then, and then back in the book of Malachi, it says in, in, in Malachi chapter 3, test me now in this. So if he says, test me now in this, and he already sent forth a blessing, he can't revoke it. That means he's going to bless you. Like I said, the word of God, the word of Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. But there has to come a time in your life when you have to make a decision either to serve the Lord or serve money. Because... Um, you know, Mammon, Jesus spoke about Mammon, and Mammon was a, a spirit that came out of Syria, and Syria was based in Babylon. In Babylon, if you look up the word Babylon, it means confusion. And when you serve money, you're always going to be confused. You're never going to be solid in your thinking, in your, in your decision making. You're going to make bad decisions, but if you put it underneath your feet, and you reign with the Lord Jesus Christ, and you let the Spirit guide you, you're always going to know what you're doing. But I want you to go with me to Matthew, I'm sorry, Luke chapter 16. Go with me to Luke, chapter 16. Glory to God. You can take your time like as if I was preaching to the congregation, but I know I'm preaching to about 50 billion people right now. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Luke, chapter 16. Hallelujah. Verse 13, when you get there, say amen right there where you're sitting or where you're washing the dishes or whatever. Glory to God. Luke 16, 13 says, hallelujah, no servant can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Today, like Elijah said, you can't, hallelujah, to, you got to either serve the Lord or serve money. You know, Joshua said, for me and Miles, we're going to serve the Lord. And when you serve the Lord and you seek first the kingdom of God and its righteousness, all these things shall be added unto you. You know, the Bible, hallelujah, if you go with me, in Proverbs, hallelujah, chapter 1. Just go with me. I'm having a good time here, hallelujah. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 3 says, hallelujah, to receive instruction in wise behavior, righteousness, justice, and equity. 
Verse 4 says to give prudence to the naive, to the youth knowledge and discretion. That means I, I, I didn't have no understanding. Understanding. I didn't have no equity. Equity is something you receive, hallelujah, when there is understanding. So when you have understanding of what it is to give and what it is to be obedient and a good steward of finance, hallelujah, then verse 7 of Proverbs takes light. It says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. I need instruction. I need wisdom and how to apply the finance God gives me here on earth. Can I get an amen? Hallelujah. So I'm going to serve the Lord no longer mammon. Amen. It's good to have it, but it's not good for it to have you. There's nothing wrong with having money. A man of God, hallelujah, told me, and I was sharing it with the men that are here in the office with me. He said, a real rich man, blessed man, man of God, wise man. He said, I'd rather you be a humble baller than be a loud mouth broke person in the gospel. Stay quiet about what God's given you. Stay humble about what God's given you. See, if you got money and it controls you, you're never going to get nothing. It's going to come and it's going to go. You know, when a man of God dies on earth, he leaves a spiritual inheritance and he leaves a physical one. But the ones that are coming behind him are going to thank him for the spiritual one of the spiritual inheritance because with wisdom and knowledge you could take care of the physical inheritance. Because a fool leaves an inheritance and another fool comes and takes it from him. But not those that belong to the hands of God and those that are under the shadow of the Almighty. Now when, when you're in love with money or you're, or you're seeking money or you're following money, it gives you a false sense of security you think that if there's money in the bank you got it made you you're going to always have something but what if the bank crashes then what remember when the stock hallelujah collapsed and people were killing themselves in the early 20s in the in the early 2000s people were killing themselves people were when they went when they went bankrupt they were like a, committing suicide because their god was money people were investing in different houses and when the stock market crashed they had nothing now, so they thought it was the end of the world. It was over because their God had to get humbled by my God. God will always come and humble and destroy whatever God that gets in the way from him getting close to you. So if they, when you love money, there's a false sense of security. Security, I'm sorry. You start making bad decisions, and you become independent. You no longer lean on God. You lean on your money. But the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5, Do not lean on your own understanding, but in all things lean on God. Can I get an amen? And then one of the things that... Be, what happens to your life when, when you start leaning on money, you become greedy. Let's be real. You know, I was, I was telling the Spanish congregation last night, man, you get so greedy, you don't even buy, you don't even buy uh, 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 cacahuates, you don't even buy peanuts because you don't even want to crack the shell, you're so greedy. You're so greedy, you want to clean up after yourself. You don't do nothing for yourself. You, like, you, 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 you can't even enjoy the fruit of your labor. You don't even take your children out because you don't want to waste that money. You don't even invest in your own self. You don't even buy nothing for yourself because you want to you wanna hoard the money that you've obtained through your sweat. When God says you have to rejoice from the fruit of your labor. And, and, and it's, it's, I've seen it. I've seen it in men. I've seen it in people in Christ. You go to the store and, and, and you get to the counter and they're waiting for you to pop out with your wallet when they just got paid, but they want you to pay for it. They want you to take care of it all the time when they should be able to give because God has given unto them. Can I get an amen? Hallelujah. God doesn't want your money. He wants your heart. God doesn't want your money. He wants your heart. So you could ask yourself, well, why do they pick up offering and tithes? You want to know why? Because he wants to see what surfaces to your flesh whenever we mention money. Go with me, hallelujah, Matthew chapter 6, for the glory of God. Matthew chapter 6, hallelujah, verse 21. When you get there, hallelujah, say amen wherever you're at. Matthew chapter 6, verse 21 says, For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Wherever your treasure is, that's where your heart's going to follow. If your treasure is in overtime making money or your treasure, hallelujah, is, is all about focused on mammon, your treasure's going to be, your heart's going to be far from God. You could say, Pastor, but God knows my heart, and I'm here to tell you, yeah, he does. It's evil, it's wicked, and it's deceitful. And if it's evil, it's going to keep you doing evil. If it's wicked, you're going to stay in wickedness and deceitful. That Your heart's going to tell you you're okay. You're okay when pastor comes to you or his pastor's wife or a leader comes to you and says, Hey, how you doing? You're going to be so focused on justifying your lies and doing, doing the evil, you're going to say, I'm okay, when really you're broke, busted, and disgusted in the spirit. That's why God wants your heart, man. He doesn't want your money. He wants to circumcise your heart. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. Hallelujah. Now, 
Have you ever, hallelujah, noticed that whoever talks about giving, those are hard-hearted people. They will always argue the, the scripture, they always uh, twist the scripture, and they will always babble why they don't give. People that never give, people that always come against giving, they're hard-hearted. They're hard-hearted. If you were to remind them how many, how many years they were in slavery and bondage to Pharaoh when they went clubbing or they were buying drugs or, or they were doing things that outside the will of God, how much money they invested in something that kept their soul broke now that God has called them to the kingdom and put their name in the Lamb's book of life, they're going to argue with God over giving them $20, $30. What is it that you make a, a, a week? $250, $25 belongs to God, $300, $30 belongs to God, whatever you offer from it. Is that, is that too hard? People that are always struggling financially always argue about giving, always complain, and they want to twist giving and being faithful to God in the little. Hallelujah. Now, if you ever, have you ever asked yourself what tithe means? What tithe means? It means 10. Now, something everybody in my church knows, 10, hallelujah, the Lord sent 10 plagues to Pharaoh. Have you ever asked yourself why? Because God was dealing with Pharaoh's heart. He sent the 10 plagues. And then, hallelujah, after he dealt with Pharaoh's heart, he sent Israel out of Egypt and, in, out of Egypt and into the promised land. He gave them the 10 commandments. Why the 10 commandments? To deal with Israel's heart. Amen? Go word to God. Now, uh, if you look at uh, Jacob's wages under his uncle Laban's care, when he fled from his brother, he went to live with his uncle, and he worked for his uncle, and Laban changed Jacob's wages 10 times. Why? Because God was dealing with his heart. Now, Daniel fasted 10 times, I mean 10 days. Why? Because it's a circumcision. It's a breaking away of the flesh. Have you, uh, the 10 virgins, hallelujah, in the Bible, the 10, the five that were prudent, the five that were unprudent and, and were left behind. Why 10? Because 10 is a cutting away from the lifestyle of the flesh. In the book of Revelation, chapter 2, verse 10, it says, I'm going to put you in jail for 10 days. Why? Not literally 10 days, but 10 days means I'm going to pass you through a small trial to see what's in your heart. How many disciples, hallelujah, that, that, that Jesus had? No, he had 12. Hallelujah. Don't forget. Don't get it twisted. <laughs> Glory to God. Now, hallelujah. Money doesn't bring peace. Money doesn't bring joy. Money doesn't bring, hallelujah, sleep. Money doesn't bring eternal life. A check cannot buy eternal life. Money cannot buy peace. You can, hallelujah, go and have a good time and buy new clothes and jewelry. And you can cover up your emptiness with today's material. Hallelujah, but down deep down in that dungeon you call heart. It's empty, it's crooked, and it's proud. And money cannot fix that. Only the obedience of the Lord Jesus Christ and how he teaches you how to be faithful in the little and be a good steward of the finance that God gives you. Go with me to 1 Timothy chapter 6. Hallelujah. 1 Timothy chapter 6. God is good. 1 Timothy chapter 6. I'm going to start reading, hallelujah, from verse 6. And the Bible says, But godliness actually is a means of great gain when accompanied by contentment. For we have brought nothing into the world, so we cannot take anything out of it either. And if we have food and covering with these, we shall be content. But those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a snare, many foolish and harmful desires, desires which plunge men into ruin and destruction. Look at verse 10. For the love of money is the root of all sorts of evil, and some by longing for it have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many a pang or many hurts or many pains. Now think about that. Why can't we be content with what God's given us? Why can't we be content? 
Some of you, hallelujah, uh, uh, want more and more. You'll do whatever it takes to smash on people, step on people, to become rich or to have money or to have something you've never had. Why can't we be content with what God's given us? Why can't we help the brethren? Why can't we help other nations? Why can't we help the missionaries around the world, hallelujah, and send them a love offering? You can say, well, why don't you? We do, hallelujah. God has taught us, hallelujah, how to help the missionary field, how to help those that don't have nothing, even your own neighbor, Hallelujah. You, they're struggling themselves, but, but, but they got to see the light of the gospel in you. Glory to God. And one of the things that verse 10 says, for the love of money. See, a lot of people say money is the root of all evil. Money is not evil. We're evil. And we do evil things with money. We're the ones. See, people say God's crazy. God's not crazy. We're crazy. We do the crazy things. God is the God of order. And if you want to be faithful in the little, God will put you in much, hallelujah, but we have to be content with what God's given us. Go with me to Ecclesiastics chapter 5, hallelujah. Ecclesiastics chapter 5. The Bible says in verse 10, hallelujah, He who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves abundance with its income. This too is vanity, verse 11, when good things increase, those who consume them increase. So what is the advantage to their owners except to look on? The sleep of the working man is pleasant, whether he eats little or much. But the, fool's, the full stomach of the rich man does not allow him to sleep. 13. There is a grievous evil which I have seen under the sun. Riches being hoarded by their owner to his own hurt. God never said hoard it. He said give it. Give it. Rivers of living water. you got to give it. Because if you keep it, it stays stale and it smells. And God, hallelujah, is not a God of stale money. He's a God of moving liquid. Hallelujah. Then, hallelujah, verse 14 says, yes, verse 14 says, When those riches were lost through a bad investment and he had fathered a son, then there was nothing to support him. Verse 15 says, As he had come naked from his mother's womb, so will he return as he came. He will take nothing from the fruit of his labor that he can carry in his hand. With nothing we come into this world and with nothing we take it. You know, it's funny. The pharaohs back then believed that when you die, there's an afterlife and they, they would bury the, 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 the pharaoh with gold and riches so he wouldn't be broke in the next life. But let me tell you something. I'd rather seek first the kingdom of God and its righteousness and have the spirit of God that I have everything than have everything on this earth and lose my soul. What's the point in having all sorts of money and losing your soul? What's the point in having riches and you can't even instruct your child? What's the, you know, it's funny. Children kill their fathers for their father's inheritance when your children should be loving on you and thanking you for the spiritual inheritance that you give them when you instruct them. Hallelujah. Many say, hallelujah, how can I be cursed when I'm under grace? Well, there's a lot of people that are, their money's cursed. You can say, well, my, my money's redeemed because I'm under grace. No, nah, man, there are curses you got to break. There are curses, hallelujah, you got you to gotta walk away from. Go with me to Matthew chapter 8, verse 17. Hallelujah. Matthew chapter 8, verse 17, for the glory of God. Matthew chapter 8. Verse 17, look at what the Bible says. It says, In order that he was spoken through Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, saying, He himself took our infirmities and carried away our diseases. Now, now just, just follow me along. Go with me to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. 1 Peter, hallelujah, chapter 2, verse 24, the Bible says, And he himself bore our sins, in his body on the cross that we might die to sin and live to righteousness for by his wounds we are healed now i'm gonna ask you i'm gonna ask you this and you can only answer right there where you're at have you ever been have you gotten sick this year from january to this very moment have you gotten sick you have a headache the flu you're congested bronchial whatever have you gotten sick if you said yes, I'm asking you, why did you get sick if he took our infirmities to the cross? Why? You say, well, well it's, it's my nature. I'm a human. Exactly. In the physical, we get sick. But how do you apply, hallelujah, his word 
unto the physical to cancel out infirmities and cancel out sicknesses and cancel out curses. Faith. So when you give your tithe and your offering, you're giving a physical act of worship, but by faith you're giving it to cancel out the curse from your money. That's why people can't get a job. People can't establish. People stop giving. Let me put it to you like this. I'm Bubba Gump. I'm, 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 I'm Forrest Gump. On one hand, I got riches and honor. And on another hand, I got curses and brokenness. You don't got to be too smart which hand you want to be. If you apply faith to your giving, then you cancel out the curse and you nail it to the cross. Because faith without works is dead. And if you can't believe, hallelujah, that God could rebuke the devourer's hand from your money through faith, you're always going to be broke. You're never going to be able to give. You're never, never going to be able to establish. You're going to have dreams, but you're gonna, all you're going to have is dreams. Don't you want to walk in your dreams? Don't you want to be a blessing to people? Don't you want to take people out? Don't you want to establish the kingdom of, uh, of God here in heaven? You see, when you give, hallelujah, to your church, you give to the missionary field. You keep the lights on. You keep the bills paid. You honor God with an act of righteousness. That's a good act, hallelujah, of righteousness for the kingdom, hallelujah. That's how you cancel out the curse, hallelujah, of, of money by faith. The Bible says, don't make me rich that I can forget who you are, and don't make me poor that I forget you and curse you. Just give me what I need, Lord. Now, if God meets your needs because he's such a great God and he comes, and he's going to be, it's going to be a great blessing. He's not a small God. He's not the God you put in a box. He's the omniscient, omnipresent, omnipotent God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's the God of faith. He's the God of promise. And he's the God of change. If you let him change your mindset, Romans chapter 12, verse 2, you'll never be broke again. You'll be content with what God gives you. And if he makes you rich, glory to God. Don't forget Pastor Julio Sandoval. Buy me a big up. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Don't forget me. Go with me to Mark chapter 4. I'm going to show you something. Hallelujah. Mark chapter 4. God is good. In Mark chapter 4, there's a couple scriptures in this chapter that I want you to get. This is your breakthrough if you want it. Look at what verse 3 says. It says, listen to this. Behold, the sower went out to sow. I'm talking about money here. I'm going to go give money. Or you can say, well, Pastor, you rich. I'm not rich. I just know when to and when not to give. So when you give, God prepares you because he knows the heart that you're a giver. See, if you're a giver, God gives you more to give because you do it for the kingdom, not for your own benefit. Come on now, say amen to that. Look at what verse 9 says. And he was saying, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Come on now, open up the ear gate, don't block it out. God wants to bless you financially. God wants to bless you, hallelujah, so you can give unto others. Now look at verse 11. And he was as, and as he was saying to them, to you has been given the mystery of the kingdom of God, but to those who are outside, they get everything in parables. Why are the carnal minded, those that fight against giving, those that fight against and twist scripture and they say, I live by the law, I live by, I mean, I live by the law, I live by grace. Those that twist, those that fight, hallelujah, giving. Their ears, hallelujah, haven't been opened, hallelujah. They don't understand what this mystery is. Why, why? You know, the hard-hearted, those that are carnal say, there goes the money, there goes to the pastor, there it goes to his house, there it goes to this. That's the carnal-minded. The spiritual say, let him do what he has to. You know, there's a saying, the proof is in the pudding. If there's fruits to prove, Hallelujah. In your church, where the money's going, keep giving. If your pastor's rolling around in a Bentley and your church is falling apart and your church ain't using the money for ministry in the mission fields or they're not helping churches in Mexico or around the world, but your pastor's all blinged out and he's wearing a three-piece suit and he's looking tight and he doesn't care what anybody's heart is, you got to stop going to that church and stop giving to that man because that man's building his own kingdom. We're not here to build our kingdom because we're already in in the kingdom and we walk with the king of the kingdom you want to hallelujah build the kingdom so people could come on in and say god is good that's why the mysteries of the kingdom for god so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son see it says a chiste that's what it's all about giving 
He gave his son. Why? Because a man of God said he wanted a family. And if you want to increase the family of your church, increase the family of, the, of, of God, give. Give the word. Give finance. Give a hug. Give a word of encouragement. But like I said, we're talking about money here. Here's the kicker. Look what verse 13 says of Roman, uh, Mark chapter 4. It says, and he said to them, do you not understand this parable? And how will you understand all parables? If you don't understand the parable of giving, why would God give you revelation of other parables? Why? If you don't understand why God sent his only begotten son, how do you expect the God of glory to give you revelation of anything else when you don't understand why he gave his son? He gave his son. We got to give. When you give, God can use you full circle. He can use you all the way around. What if you go to a &P and What if you go to Assembly Line? What if you go to eat and God says, give that man $100? You're going to say, no way. That's not God. That's the devil. No, it's not. That's God trying to use your full circle that you limit yourself to God's blessing. You could go to the gas station. There's a drunk that comes up to you. He says, hey, give me 10 bucks. But you see him with alcohol. You, get, you have a beer can. And God says, give it to him. You're like, no, you fight it. Why? Who cares what that man does with the alcohol? You're not here to judge him. You just be here to be obedient. Because if you can be obedient with 10 bucks and then you get a $100 reward from God, Holly, what about when God says, give the man a $1,000 and then God wants to give you $10,000? We limit God's blessing. You see, you could be a pastor listening to me right now. You, you're content with your like 60 members and you're content with it. And God says, give, give, hallelujah, give everything you got because I want to give you 500 members. Your pastor has 500 members. You're content. I got it. I'm being blessed financially, and you're done. When God said, I want to give you 1,000 members. You got 10,000 members. You're content. You're blessed. I don't need to give the mission field. I know what I'm doing. When God says, is that all you want? Is that all you want to fill heaven with 10,000 members? Give. I'll give you 100,000 members around the world. I'll give you 50. I'll give you 1,500 churches here, 10,000 churches here. Why do we as men limit God from using us? Full circle. Hallelujah. Go, you know, J.D. Rockefeller, before I read something, it said, J.D. Rockefeller, we all know Rockefeller, rich man, rich, 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 rich man. He said, I have made millions, but it didn't make me happy. I'm actually the poorest man on the earth. Why? Because all the friends I got is my money. This is J.D. Rockefeller. He died miserable because the only friends he had was his money. Because when you have money, this is something I told the Spanish church. I said, when you have money, you actually are able to discern who really loves you and who just uses you. You'll be able to discern because it becomes a weapon now. It's not a necessity. Like I was telling a couple men of God earlier, it's a weapon. You used to bless. You used to pierce. You used to love on. You used to trailblaze because it's now a weapon. No longer do you need it. Because the Bible says, hallelujah, you are the lender now. No longer the borrower. See, there's a season where you are the borrower and you learn how to be faithful in the little. Then you become the lender. You, it becomes a weapon. But you actually start learning how to discern, hallelujah, who's using you for it and who's actually being a blessing by receiving it from you. Amen? There's another man named Cornelius Vanderbilt. He made his money on railroads and, and he, was a, he was a business tycoon. He was the founder of Vanderbilt University, the Commodores, hallelujah. He said this, to take care of millions it's nothing fun, and there is no happiness in it. He was more worried about taking care of his money than anything else. Another man that became miserable. From 1900 to 1950, the 10 most richest people, eight of them committed suicide. Why? Because money can't fill your heart. Luke chapter 3, verses 4, 5, and 6 says, I'm going to fill your empty ravine with my water. I'm going to make all crooked ways straight. And I'm going to bring all high hill and mountain low. The minute you humble yourself and say, I'm done seeking for money. I'm going to seek for my father. And I'm going to be content. Hallelujah. For what I had. Go with me to the book of Philippians. Hallelujah. Something my, my big brother Paul said. Hallelujah. Philippians chapter 3. Verse. Hallelujah. Verse 7. It says. But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of surpassing value of knowing Jesus, Christ Jesus, my Lord, from whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but rubbish in order 
that I may gain Christ. I'd rather know who I'm talking about than have a bunch of money and squander it and look like a fool. I want to know Jesus Christ. Money doesn't buy my way into heaven. There was a, a wizard, a warlock, a movie called Spanish, a brujo, in the book of Acts that tried to pay, try to pay for, the, for the gifts. Peter said, you and your money perish. Money can't do nothing for you in the kingdom. You got to learn how to be a good steward of it. You got to let it be a weapon in your hands on how to bless people. You cannot get the gifts from money. This is free, hallelujah. And if God is the owner of all the silver and gold, and he's the owner of the cattle on a thousand hills, what are we worried about? Hallelujah. The birds of the air don't have a bank account. They don't got Bank of America or Wells Fargo, and God still blesses him. Look at your son. In the Bible, Jesus said, we being evil, and if our son asks us for something to eat and we're down to our last bite on our Big Mac, we're going to give it to our son because we being evil, we still love our children. The Bible says that he is good. And if he is good, how much more would he give you if you ask in Jesus' name? It says, knock, and he will answer. Seek, and you shall find. Call, and he shall respond. Jeremiah 29, he says, I have good plans for you. Not plans of calamity nor of destruction, but to give you an expected end. Jeremiah chapter 15 says, I found your word, and it was a sweet taste to my mouth. I found your word. See, when you find God's word, it's so much sweeter than what this world could give you financially. I'm not, I'm not, don't, don't get me wrong. There's nothing wrong with money. But in the presence of God, the Bible says to be with the Lord one day is better to be a thousand days outside his will. Money will have you astray from God. Over time will have you astray from being being at church money will have you seeking more money and and, and, and your children at home are like where's my dad where's my mom where, where, where where's the guy they call man of God where's the woman they call woman of God all your children want to have is a father that can instruct them in the things of God hallelujah they don't care how much money you could give them they don't care how many games you can buy them an Xbox after a while Xbox gets boring PlayStation gets boring they just want to play catch with their dad they just want to shoot the breeze with their father they want to walk around the block with their mother you don't need money and you that are married you don't need money to make your wife happy remember when you were broke busted and disgusted and you didn't even know how to mix, mix, mix match your clothes and you took your girlfriend to the park you were broke brother you had no money but she still loved you and she fell in love with you she loved you hallelujah without money and now you're trying to prove to her that you could give her with money come on baby seek first the kingdom of god and its righteousness then all these things shall be added unto you. Money has you twisted. It's blinded you. It's deceived you. Put it aside. Hallelujah. Start building the altar once again before God. Hallelujah. And let God bless you. Let God bring the blessing to your children. You can't do everything. You're going to get tired. That's why he says, you that are weary and heavy laden. Weary is spiritually tired, laden, and burdened from all the things of the physical. Grab the physical and the spiritual and bring it to God so you can, hallelujah, rise up again under the light of the of the gospel and be focused once again on the way the truth and the life come on now somebody say amen hallelujah go with me to hebrews chapter 7 verse 8 i'm almost done with the introduction we're going to go into the message now glory to god hallelujah hebrews chapter 7 if i can find it glory to god hallelujah hebrews chapter 7 Verse 8. Remember, this is New Testament for those people that say, I don't live by the law, I live by grace. Well, I got something from you in the New Testament. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 8, it says, In this case, mortal men receive tithes. That means every pastor receives tithe from you. Whatever church you go to, it could be the rock, it could be the way, it could be Church of Fire and Christ, it could be Echoes of Love, it could be the Assemblies of God, it could be the Four Scripture. Any church where you sit, the pastor, mortal man, receives tithes. But in that case, one receives them. But in that case, one receives them, okay? Of whom it is witnessed that he lives on. Who do we preach about that's living on? Who rose from the dead? Who The tomb couldn't keep the one we preach about, hallelujah. He is that one who we preach about, Jesus. In that case, you cannot give your tithe to a mortal man without acting out in faith. The minute you act out your faith, 
Jesus receives your tithe in heaven spiritually. So when you're going through something, your tire blows out, your refrigerator goes out, there ain't nothing to eat, you get that phone call. Somebody comes knocking on that door. Somebody gives you a Pentecostal handshake and they give you some money on it. Somebody blesses you with a bag of chicken. Somebody takes you out and buys you clothes. An opportunity to go preach opens up so you can hallelujah, bring home the money to pay the bills. Something, a door opens up. Why? Because you give, you act it out by faith, hallelujah, and not by sight. You acted and trusted God, hallelujah, at his word, because he's the one we preach that he lives. Come on now, say amen. This is New Testament. This is New Testament. I receive your tithes here. But there he receives them by faith. So when he receives them by faith, he cancels out the curse of your finance. So your finance can keep flowing as rivers of living water. Glory to God. Go with me to Matthew chapter 5. Watch this. I'm going to show you something. Matthew chapter 5. Verse 17, glory to God. Look at what the Bible says. Do, you, do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. What is, God, what is Jesus saying? This is red writing. Jesus said, I didn't come to annihilate the, the law. I came to fulfill it and live the prophets out. So basically he's saying, I came to talk about the law and live it in the new. Come on now. Look at verse 18. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass away from the law until it is accomplished. Now, this is great. This is the greatest scripture I found on giving. Now, watch. Look at 19. Whomever, whoever then annuls one of the least of the commandments, that's the Old Testament, and so teaches others shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever keeps and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So when someone says, I don't live by the law, you're least. I'm teaching. I want to be great. I want to be great. I'm not taking away. He came to fulfill it. And if I want to be like Jesus, I came to fulfill the old and live out the new under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. I don't want to be a small teacher. I want to be a great teacher for my father because my father was a great teacher himself. His name is Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Here's the icing on the cake. Look at 20. For I say to you that unless your righteousness surpasses the scribes hmm, and the Pharisees, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. Okay. You say, so my, me not giving is going to take me to hell? No, 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 no. Listen, listen. Why? Remember, the kingdom of heaven, revelation, mysteries, understanding, power, uh, understanding, uh, um, knowledge. He says, if you allow your flesh to get in the way, Pharisees, flesh, scribes, flesh, you'll never get the mysteries of the knowledge of what comes from heaven. You've got to overcome the flesh, submit the flesh, and say, flesh, I'm circumcising you today. Act out my spiritual giving by faith so I can go into the kingdom where I'm supposed to be getting revelation from in the spirit and give unto others because it's been given unto me. The minute you give, you tell the flesh, shut up. I'm not going to give the $1 that's all ripped up in my left pocket. I'm going to give the $20 that's brand new. Hallelujah. Because I'm going to sow 20 seeds so I could get 20 trees, so I could get a lot of apples. Hallelujah. So I could bless other people. Because one seed from an apple brings apple apples from a tree. Hallelujah. Many apples. A lot of people could eat. Birds from the air could come and make a nest in the one apple tree. And then the apple tree gives shade under green pastures. So people that are scorched from this world, people that are hurt from this world, they come underneath your tree and honey, they get, they, get, they get shadow and they get eat from the tree that you're bearing. It's a good tree. It's a good fruit. Hallelujah. And people will say, God is good. Hallelujah. Now, I want you to uh, I want, you to, I want you to think about this, hallelujah. Well, in Revelation chapter 19, we're going to go there right now. You know what, let's just go there. Revelation chapter 19, hallelujah. The Bible says, hallelujah, in verse 7, it says, Let us rejoice and be glad and give the glory to him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. So we got to do something to get ready for the coming of of the Lord. Now watch. Look at verse 8. And it was given to her clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Hmm. 
Righteous acts. There's something we do here that's righteous that keeps our linen fine. There's things that you do here, hallelujah, that keeps you looking good, buying clothes and being able to give and having frijoles and arroz and all pozole verde and God blesses you. There's something you do here, just a righteous act that you do here that prepares you for the coming glory. So what you sow here keeps you clothed, pays the bills, pays the rent. The righteous acts under, hallelujah, a law given on earth. And I looked it up, hallelujah. That word, hallelujah, righteous, it means, hallelujah, the chaos in the Greek. And it means, hallelujah, observing a divine law, hallelujah, and being upright, being faultless, being non-guilty. So when I give, I know in my heart, I'm not guilty of not giving. And I'm upright before God because I didn't steal nothing from him. And I've observed his spiritual law to fulfill the righteous act so when I go to heaven, I already know what's coming. You see, when you don't give, you don't know what's coming. You don't know if you're going to get that 40 hours. You don't know if you're going to get that job. But when you give, hallelujah, you rebuke the devourer's hand. God, re God reimburses your righteous act on earth by giving you a sweater, some shoes, hallelujah, and what you need. So when you go to heaven, your righteous acts down here get you blessed up there. I'm not saying it's by works that get you blessed, but because of obedience, I give my tithe. So I'm not found faultless before God. I'm not found guilty before the word of God, but I'm in right standing before our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Masticate a little bit on that. Masticate a little bit on that. Tithing is a biblical law. It's law. We all know that. It's, it's, it's something, hallelujah, that we learned from the beginning. And I'm going to take you to the beginning before I end out, hallelujah. My time is running out. But in Genesis chapter 14, I'm going to read something to you. It's biblical. Tithing is biblical. We all know that. People say, well, it's the law. Well, come down. We're going to get somewhere with this. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 14, verse 18, the Bible says, And Melchizedek came, and the king of Salem brought out bread and wine. Now he was a priest of God, most high, and he blessed him, speaking of Abraham, and said, Blessed be Abraham of God most high, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And he gave him a tenth of all. A tenth of all. This is 500 years before Moses even picked up a pen and started writing the book of Malachi. This is 500, 500 years? So... When someone says, I don't live by the law, well, Abraham didn't either. See, when it's birthed in you, when you're a, a, a man and a woman of spirit, the spirit will always concord with what's going on in heaven, and you'll drop it down here so you can be obedient. The Bible says in Romans chapter 8, wherever the spirit of the Lord is, that's where the sons of God will be. Hallelujah. Now, Cain and Abel, they both gave. Cain killed Abel. They gave is an act of giving 2,500 years before the law was written. So an act of giving is even before the law was written. Moses wrote it, but even before he wrote it, they were already giving. So why is it that in your heart you don't want to give your tithe and offering? Is it because uh, 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 you're greedy? Is it because you're hard-hearted? Is it because your heart is still hasn't been circumcised by the Holy Spirit? Let God be your judge. And if you really look at it, like they say, I'm giving you proof, and it's in the pudding why you're not giving. Break the curse in Jesus' name. Live, live a life of faith, and not by acts. You can go to church. You can look good, but you ain't got money in your pocket. I want to go to church and look good, have a little something, so after church I go buy myself a bag of Cheetos and a big gulp and maybe treat my kids to something to eat. Hallelujah. God came to kill and destroy the curse in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Now, I'm going I'm to... I'm going to finish with this. In Genesis chapter 28, 22, Jacob, fleeing from Esau, made a covenant with God that if he was to take care of him and take care of his children, that he would give a tenth of his portion. The Bible says in Deuteronomy, hallelujah, chapter 26, that I do want to read. I'm sorry. Deuteronomy chapter 26. This is an amazing scripture in Bible, hallelujah. The Bible says in Deuteronomy chapter 26, 1 and 2, check this out. It says, Then it shall be when you enter the land which the Lord your God gives you as an inheritance, and you possess it and live in it, 
that you shall take some of the first of all the produce of the ground, your first fruits, which you shall bring in from the land of the Lord that God gives you, and you shall put it in a basket and go to the place where the Lord your God chooses to establish his name. Okay, we don't have baskets anymore. Come on now. We have envelopes. <laughs> you know when we pick up the tithing offering at your church? What do they do? They lift up their hand and they have envelopes. You put your, the consecrated, they, you put your tithe in an envelope. That's the basket, hallelujah, that we bring to the place designated where God's name is glorified. We just read that. We glorify God at church. We glorify his name at church. And you put your tithe in that basket. Because after we, hallelujah, put your, your tithe in that, in that envelope, we put it in the basket or whatever you put your money in, and we pray and we bless the place where God has honored his name. Now look at what verse, hallelujah, 13 says. And you shall say before the Lord your God, I have removed the sacred portion from my house. You know what the sacred portion is? The tithe. I've removed the sacred portion. The tithe, I've removed it from my house. Basically saying, I will not use it for what's mine. Watch. And also I've given it to the Levite and the alien and the orphan and the widow according to other commandments which thou hast commanded me. I have not transgressed or forgotten any of that commandment. Look at 14. Highlight it. I have not eaten of it while mourning, nor have I removed any of it while I was unclean, nor offered any of it to the dead. I have listened to the voice of the Lord my God. I have done according to all that thou hast commanded me. Look at what it says. First, I'm going to read it again. I have not eaten of it. I didn't use it for my double cheeseburger. While mourning, oh, I felt bad, so I used my tithe to do something. Mm -mm. Then it says, I have not removed any of it while I was unclean. When you fell from grace and you fell and you went back and did your thing, this man saying, I didn't even use it for what I want to go do. I didn't use it to buy a beer. I didn't use it to go buy drugs. I didn't use it to go clubbing. I didn't use it. This belongs to God. And when it belongs to God, even in mourning. And then it says, hallelujah, and I didn't, didn't even offer it any of it to the dead. What does it mean? The dead? No. People that don't have Jesus Christ. Why am I going to give what's consecrated to someone, hallelujah, that don't even know Jesus? I'm going to use what God for God. And then God will give me more to bless them later. But I got to be faithful in the little, hallelujah. Look at verse 15. Look down from the holy habitation from heaven and bless thy people Israel and the ground which thou hast given us, a land flowing with milk and honey, how thou dost swear to our fathers. God promised our fathers, hallelujah. That he will bless us. And God is not a man to lie, nor a son of man to go back on his word. And I'm going to finish with this in Colossians. Hallelujah. Glory to God. My time is up. Colossians chapter 1. Glory to God. The Bible says in Colossians chapter 1 verse 16. It says, For by him all things were created, both in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created by him and for him. Your money is his. Quit fighting and give it back. Let him have 10% dominion and you have 90% dominion. And watch what happens to your life, to your children, to your finance, to your descendants, to your neighbors. You become a walking blessing. I'm not saying, like I said, he's going to make you rich. But if he does, glory to God, he decides what he wants to do. But once God meets your needs, you will never be the same again. Amen. This is Pastor Julio from the Church of Fire in Christ. I pray that it was a blessing to your life. I pray that it's a blessing to those that heard. Hallelujah. I know, hallelujah, that if you put it, if you put it to work, you put your faith to work, you're never going to be the same again. Yeah, one day I'll share my testimony of where I come from and how broke I was. And how limited I was. And I'm not a pros uh, prosperity preacher. I don't got time to teach on prosperity. I'm just going to teach you the instructions on how to have enough. And when he meets your needs, it's so great you're able to bless people. In Jesus' name, God bless you. Amen.